Yeah, good morning. I'm excited. Excited about the variety of presentations and the broad spectrum. I'm also excited because for me it's a difficult task to talk to you, as I assume most of you are lay persons. And if I want to recite a little bit the public understanding on stem cells, I recently saw a clip in New York when they asked just passenger on the road, what are stem cells? If you would see that, you would be feeling very good because the answer was stem cells kills babies, stem cells are responsible for AIDS, stem cells have something to do with, uh, I don't know, and there was only one girl which really had an idea what stem cells are. And that's currently our problem, um, which I faced since 12 years doing basic research in stem cells. I also would like, in a good academic tradition, point out there is a conflict of interest, so unlike the other speakers which are completely biased, I'm only partially biased because I do a lot of research in my heart primarily as a scientist, but I'm also the chairman of a company which does stem cell therapy. The confusion is really not only with the public, it is also with politicians and my colleagues in science and research. And when you look in the media, there's a lot of saying, embryos cloned for stem cells, stem cells, what's in the name, stem cells, snake oil. And this is the biggest enemy of any progress. So one of my tasks today to you is to demystify stem cells somewhat and bring it to what stem cells are really that is part of our life, of our aging, and of our dying. Now, in the past, we talked about embryonic stem cells. Let me be clear. I don't think there will be any future in clinical application for stem cells from embryos for two reasons. This is a different individual. Your body will reject those cells. And if there are some people saying stem cells are immune privileged, that's correct, as long as they are stem cells. But when they mature and become adult, they express the surface markers of the baby they come from, and your body naturally rejects those cells. So. It's good for research to understand pathways, we do it as well, but it has no value in clinical application. Now there is currently a shift that even the Vatican is moving toward. On April 16th, we will have a big conference at the Vatican supporting autologous stem cells from our body for our body. And why is that the case? When I started with stem cell research 12 years ago, there was a simple understanding of what the regenerative power should be. And if you look at this iguana, the tail regrows. Now for me it was clear that this regrowth of an organ would not come from bone marrow, which was at those days assumed to be the source. For me it was clear the stem cells need to be in blood vessels. And when you analyze the description of stem cells all over the body, it finally reduces that we have stem cells in every organ. And these stem cells are sitting in the small blood vessels. So you can isolate blood vessels or these stem cells from every organ, and they will function in a way that they can regenerate every organ as well. So that's very simple. Nature has given us a pool of regenerative cells which are distributed throughout liver, heart, bone, cartilage, wherever you have blood vessels, you find those cells. Now, when you look into an organ, you don't find stem cells alone. So most people talk about stem cells, stem cells, stem cells. Stem cells are really pretty rare. You see, this is, for example, from adipose tissue. When you process the tissue, you find a variety of cells, and they all look a little different. You have naked cells here, which are lymphocytes. You have larger cells, which are progenitor cells, which already decided to become something in life. And then you have these small cells, and these are the real stem cells. Now, how can I say that these cells are able to form any organ in the body? We did the following experiment. We took one single cell here, and after 20 hours, when you pamper that cell, it becomes two cells. And then, after 48 hours, six, eight cells, and then you can make millions of cells which are genetically all the same because they are derived from one single cell. And then you subject those cells, you take 100,000 of those cells after a month and put them in an adipogenic differentiation media. It's like a baking recipe. And the cells start to form fat cells. You also can induce bone, 
you can induce liver, and you can induce neurogenesis nerves. That means a single cell is able to differentiate into all three lineages of your body, endoectomesoderm. And it doesn't depend on where you take those cells from. You can take these cells from your heart, from your brain, from your muscle, from your skin. It is able to form all three lineages. And that's the universal principle of nature, which helps us to regenerate ourselves. The difference is between embryonic cells and adult cells, that embryonic cells can form an organ which is still not existing. That's also cancer. Adult cells can form all three lineages, endo, ecto, mesoderm, but only if the environment te tells the cell and the clues what to become. This, for example, is a communication between a rat cardiomyocyte and a human cell. So the human stem cell from adipose tissue, that's a nucleus, starts forming a cardiomyocyte, which means a heart muscle cell. That was fascinating to me because it indicates the hierarchy of nature that even human cells understand the language of a rat cell. That's evolution. Now, when you look under an electron microscopy to those cells, you find some very specific surface things, which are like little tennis balls sitting there, and they encode genetic information. And this is a way stem cells learn what to become. Though the cell encapsulated microRNA transcription factors in those surface structures, and then they also form tunnular, uh, little micro tunnels, while they uh, shift genetic information from one to the other, and that's the way the cells orient themselves. Let me show you that video. These are two types of cells. One cell we labeled green, the other one has these quantum dots, which is tiny nanoparticles. And I look at the green cell, it migrates towards this cell. Now they approach each other. Now they kiss each other. And now they form a tubular structure here through which the genetic information from one cell goes in the other. And by that way, if you inject the stem cell in an organism which has living cells, the cells communicate and get the genetic information. It's like putting up and down a couple of switches so the cells understand what to do and what to become. In addition, you find these little tiny microsomes which also help to orient the cells. The principle of regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy is pretty easy. You have an organ like a heart, there are some cells dying, and you have replacing stem cells. But with a lifespan, the cells die earlier. When you are born, cells live a long time, 30 years, and when you have hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, cells live less than a month. So there is a disbalance between dying cells and replacing cells. This especially since stem cells take longer to multiply, that means from one to two cells, or from one million to two cells, when you age. Stem cell therapy is nothing but taking cells from one tissue and inject them into the dying tissue, which is in need of those cells. And the most easy place we found, you can take cells from everywhere, bone marrow, muscle, you can take a part of brain, some people would not like that, some like it perhaps. The most easy place to take it is from the adipose tissue because you have a lot of blood vessels there which are, has the stem cells. And most people say, can it be a little bit more? You don't need much, you need 100 grams, not much. You can process those cells, and I don't want to go into the details of this. And depending on the way you process, you find millions of cells. Now comes the easy part. I show you some samples. This is a scar of a patient which had a car accident. That was a year old. You inject stem cells, and it rebuilds the scar tissue. That's a young patient here, treated in Munich. She had alopecia totalis. That means all the hair was gone. After three times treatment, all the hair came back. That was the first animal we treated with a degloving injury. This is... Uh, a horse, 23 year old, it was running in a fence, and for one year it didn't heal with stem cells. You see, after one week already, this wound which didn't heal for a year, which encouraged us to go to patients. Now you see a big ulcer which was also there for more than a year, and you see it heals in 10 weeks. 
That's the 85-year-old lady, which for six years had open legs, terrible, she was constantly in pain. Now, um, all the conventional treatment didn't help her. And I was surprised that, in that at that age even, the wound was healing. This is a lady with a breast cancer operation in 2010. You can see the breast was removed. Here is a scar tissue. And we injected stem cells together with some mixture of her adipose tissue, which we processed to keep the collagen, the matrix in of that, and mix it with stem cells. And after half a year, you see in the MRI that the breast really regrows. That's the new one. That's the old one. She also got a breast lift to make it more look alike. And interestingly, the scar, which was clearly visible here, three years old, went away. And this is after one year, you see that there is still the same size, no shrinkage. That's another patient here. Cartilage repair is also feasible. You look in the knee here, that's the cartilage which is missing, that's the bone, and it's bone on bone here. And after one year, you see new cartilage has formed here. Especially in that patient, you see when you look in the knee, that's the femur, that's the uh, tibia. On both sides, the cartilage is missing. So new cartilage forms, and you see always a sharp line. We go into histology also, and you see the stem cells in that patient form typical three-layer cartilage. So it's not only a scar tissue. And interestingly, in that patient, his left knee was treated without stem cells. Otherwise, the same procedure, but no stem cells. So it's a good comparison, because otherwise the procedure was the same. And you see here, you have no zonal organization of the cartilage. It's kind of a amorphous scar. And then you have scattered chondrocytes on that part, which is not very resistant. It's not attached to the bone. Tendons also is something which is healing slowly. And you see here, that's a tendon defect in a horse. You see in ultrasound this black shadow here where there was a tear in this tendon. And after stem cell injection, after four weeks already, you see that this void space was filled, enabling that horse going back to training and will go to race now again. It was a former winner of some derbies. From the horses, we went to patients. That's my, one of my sons. He did a stupid thing, kite serving in winter, and he rubbed his on a hard score. Uh, and uh, he ripped off his tendon out of the bone here, and it was damaged. You see here, the structure is interrupted with stem cells. In four weeks, the tendon healed like in a horse. That's a patient who came in a wheelchair, 43 years old, and you see that's his hip bone on the left side, and you see it's not round anymore, and here is very little bone structure. It is called what you call a necrosis of the bone. And everybody told him, you need two new hips. And he said, I'm 43 years old. I don't want artificial hips, because in 10 years, in the next generation, I'm 53, and in 63, they cannot operate anymore on me. So we gave him stem cells, and you see that the cartilage formed again, and the bone virtually got round again and reconstituted, and he is walking without problems now. That's an impressive dog from Mexico. He was running in a car and injured himself, and he got a paralysis. So poor guy, normally you would say, OK, that's it. There's nobody who can help that guy. And uh, if you would have asked me, I would have given you that answer. But we have a very enthusiastic veterinarian, and he treated the dog with IV and local injection of stem cells on the two sides of his spine. This is after one week. He certainly is not ready to run fast, but after two weeks already, he recovered. Now, some people ask me, is that the same dog? I must say, yes, it's not his brother, it's himself. And that's in him, you can tell now. <laughs> Everything works again, yeah? Okay, now that's a patient uh, from Houston. Uh, his wife came and said, uh, I think my husband yes, is going to die in the next six weeks. Okay. And he had a neurological had disease. He can do much, too much and you can tell he has this kind of speech like people with Parkinson and the disease is called ALS. The muscles have basically shut down. 
He has severe motoric difficulties, trauma. I used to be a nutrition superintendent in my young know, you know, years, I guess it's so. And had about 89 people underneath me. I'd like to be able to function again. That's what it is. I try just doing small, simple things like walking. And, and eventually, you see into a lot of hope and function. Hope it'll help out a lot of people. So that was after four weeks when he received stem cells, his own stem cells. <laughs> yeah. You already can tell his mimic has changed. He has a face again. And I must say I was totally surprised because I told him, worst case, we cannot do harm to you, but I don't assume that you can help him. Okay. Come back. And come back to me. Come back to me. Hey. You're doing so great! <laughs> I can't believe it! It's really good! And his motoric skills improved greatly, and the most impressive was that his wife reported that he was able to have control over his urine. He was incontinent, and after eight weeks it started that he had control over his bladder again. That's another patient. He was in a wheelchair also with ALS, a that very deadly a disease. Better, he was from uh, Canada. Now, but the future of medicine is not only regenerative medicine. We are able, we will be able to use those cells as Trojan horses to treat cancer. If you have been here this morning, there were several approaches about immune therapy. All has a kind of a point there. But in principle, the most important thing is to find a very specific target without poisoning the rest of your body and just attack some features of the tumor. Now, as I was professor at MD Anderson, we did a lot of research, and what you see here is one of the principles of that. If you take tumor cells, you see the nucleus, but there's no expression of this alpha smooth muscle actin, which makes stem cells precursors of building the house for the tumor. When you co-culture both together, you see all of a sudden your stem cells become all green, indicating they are ready to build the house for the tumor. Assume the tumor it's very specific. It's epithelial cells, so most of the time they cannot build their own house. So a liver tumor is not only liver cells, it's also the framework and the vascularization and other things where the tumor lives in. Now that was some of the first pathways which we identified that tumor cells and stem cells communicate. Now typically, when you go ahead and inject in a mouse some tumor cells, after four weeks, you find a tumor. When you inject tu tumor cells in a mouse, but you add stem cells, the tumor is three times as big as normally. So the, tumor the stem cells help typically a tumor to grow and to build its house. But when you block the axis of communication between the two, the tumor is only 10% as large with a knockdown of a certain receptor. And that the tumor cells actually go the stem cells go in the tumor is this picture which shows the green cells are building a blood vessel for the tumor. So they help to grow the tumor and build its house. But you can use this also as a therapy, which we are currently doing. I just show you that's a wild type, that's tumor cells injected into the skin of a mouse. And you see after six weeks, you have a quite sizable tumor. And after eight weeks, typically the mice die. When you knock down a certain gene, which is responsible for those microsomes, you see the tumor is not growing. So that's very targeted therapy that you interrupt the communication between the tumor and the stem cells, which help them to build the house. So that will be part of the next generation. In addition to that, regenerative cells will be used in a wild, in a wide application. And it will be, our prediction is it will be certainly 20% of our medicine. As people age more, there will be some 
more need for local repair. And the principle is you take your stem cells from where you can get them, your adipose tissue, you process them within an hour and inject them at the site where you need them. It might be your knee, it might be your heart, it might be your tendon, it might be a non-healing wound. Thank you.